Let's get right into it. Um, for this session, we're going to be talking about weeds, identification, and um, herbicide technology. And my pointer is stuck. Okay. So, um, normally when we do presentations, if we use material from other extension agents, we'd like to give them credit. Um, we're all a team. And so some of the information in this presentation was put together by a team of extension agents in the Northeast District. All right, so what's the definition of a weed? Pretty much a weed is defined officially as a plant growing in the wrong place. So if you're a corn farmer and there are a bunch of tomato plants in your cornfield, the tomato plants are weeds. Um, why are weeds important? Because they shelter insects, diseases, pests. Um, they can also be dangerous to farm animals. There are many horses that die annually from eating um, creeping indigo. Um, weeds tend to grow in disturbed areas and can encroach and compete with desired plant, desirable plants. And so weeds are an issue. All right, so there are various methods of controlling weeds. We always like to say um, you want to use an integrated pest management approach. Weeds are pests, um, so herbicides are considered pesticides. Uh, but before you go to chemical control, we always say you want to do integrated pest management. So here is a list of various strategies used in um, integrated pest management of weeds. So you want to prevent weeds from occurring by not moving weed seeds from one area to another, which is why you want to clean off any kind of mowers, brush, brush hogs or anything. You want to clean off the, the weed seeds before you take that piece of equipment to another area. Otherwise, you'll be spreading weeds. Um, manual removal, which is, you know, you pulling the weeds. Cultural practices um, include fire, there are several weeds that um, fire is used to control, like in natural areas. There are biological control measures, like your air potato beetle and your alligator weed flea beetle. There is mechanical removal by machinery. Um, so you'll see aquatic weed management here, where they're actually physically removing the weeds via machinery. And then you have your herbicides. We always say you would like to, you don't want to start with herbicides because herbicide resistance is a huge issue. So you do want to try to see if there are other means of controlling your weeds before resorting to herbicides. So in order to properly control weeds, you have to figure out what it is you're trying to control. Weeds are classified into grasses, broad leaves and sedges. Um, and this is important to know because grass weed killers may not work on broadleaf weeds if it's a selective herbicide. And broadleaf herbicides will not work on grass weeds if it's a selective herbicide. And so you need to know what it is you're trying to control before you try to control it. So just a rundown of the characteristics of graph, grass weeds. So grass weeds are usually lo longer than wide and when it comes to the blades, when it comes to describing the blades, the blades are usually longer than wide. We use that characteristic to describe grass weeds because even though we consider broadleaf weeds a type of category, you cannot just tell it's a broadleaf weed by looking at it. There are some grass weeds that can be mistaken for grass for broadleaves and vice versa. So you want to know the characteristics of the weed you're trying to identify. The blades are alternately alternately attached to the stem and the veins run parallel. They're not connected. So when I show you a picture of the broadleaf weed, you'll be able to understand this characteristic more um, 
in detail. So if you can see my pointer here, grasses have veins that run parallel to the midrib. So the midrib is a very pronounced vein here that you can see by my pointer. And then veins in grasses will always run parallel to your midrib. And that's how you know it's a grass weed. The stems of grass weeds are also hollow and round. So some examples will, it will include your, your goose grass, torpedo grass, which is everybody's favorite grass to hate, and um, your crabgrass. Sandspur is also another grass weed that people love to hate as well. And so these are just some examples here, if you can see with my pointer. Now your broadleaf weeds differ from your grasses in that if you look closely at the midrib, the veins do not run parallel to the midrib. And this is how you know it's a broadleaf weed. So if you have a broadleaf weed that could be mistaken for a grass, what you want to do is you want to pay close attention to the veins and how they're attached to the midrib. And then you'll know for sure whether it's a broadleaf weed or it's a grass weed. So veins that are not parallel to the midrib, we call it net venation or net like veins. Um, and so the, ve the veins are not parallel to the midrib and many of them will have brightly colored flowers or easily identifiable flowers versus grasses that tend to have um, inflorescences that are difficult to um, actually see the petals and the, the arrangement of the flowers. So here are some examples of broadleaf weeds. Um, this picture is of your Florida pusley. There is a huge debate about the Florida pusley. People either love it or hate it, but there's no middle ground. Um, we've actually had people asking us, where can they get pusley seeds from because they love to see it on their lawns. Um, so pusley is one of those, you love it or hate it kind of weeds. Um, it's also called Florida snow because it looks like snow on your lawn um, during the cool months of the year. Here are some other examples of broadleaf weeds, chickweed, your matchweed, dollarweed, your yellow wood sorrel, your Asiatic hawk spirit, and your creeping bega weed. Again, it is important to know what kind of weed you're trying to control because when you look at your label, your label will say what kind of weed the active ingredient is effective on. And so I don't have money to burn. I don't personally know of anyone who has money to, to burn. Um, and so if you're applying an herbicide to um, a set of weeds and no one knows if the active ingredient can control those weeds, then you just might be burning money. So here are here um, the third category of weed type is um, your sedges. And your sedges will look similar to grasses, but there are many grass herbicides that will not work on sedges. And this is because the biology of sedges grasses and broadleaf weeds are different from each other. And when we go into the section on herbicide technology, you'll understand why it is that some herbicides will not work on some types of weeds. So the stems on a sedge are usually triangular in cross section, and I'll show you what it looks like in a slide. And so instead of being round like a grass, a stem is triangular in cross section. Usually you'll have leaves in clusters of three and sedges tend to be um, opportunistic where there are low lying or wet areas, but it doesn't mean that they will not grow um, in Dry, drier areas. So this is what I was talking about, the cross-section of uh, 
sedge stem is triangular. So if you rolled the sedge in your fingers, it would feel like a pencil that has edges. And so we always say sedges have edges and that's how you know it's not a grass, it's a sedge. Some examples of sedges are your yellow nut sedge, purple nut sedge, and your globe sedge. And we will show pictures of those in fluorescences. So um, Kailinga is also a sedge. And um, I'll show you some pictures of the what we call the seed heads. Generally, you can tell the differences between your sedges and grasses um, when you look at the seed heads. Although that is a little bit paradoxical because nobody wants weeds to go to seed. When your weeds go to seed, it's really more difficult for you to control them. But if you're trying to identify whether it's globe sedge or it's um, kailinga, generally you won't be able to do that unless you can tell the difference between your seed heads. So in addition to whether it's a broadleaf, a grass, or a sedge, weeds are also categorized based on their life cycles. And so you'll have an annual life cycle, you'll have a biennial life cycle, and you'll have a perennial life cycle. Um, and this is important to know because it will dictate how you treat your weeds in terms of trying to get proper control. So your annual weeds, um, they, once they germinate from seed, they will produce vegetative growth, which means they'll put out flowers and shoots. Then they'll start their reproductive growth stage. And that means they'll start reproducing seeds. Once the mother plant produces seeds, that mother plant dies. And so the next generation will depend on the seeds that were sown by that mother plant. And so an annual will complete its, cycle, its life cycle in one year. So if, for example, you'll see like your puzzly, the puzzly plants that you see last winter, that you saw last winter, are not the same plants you will see this coming winter. What happens is a mother plant will produce seeds and then that mother plant will die because it's an annual weed. It will complete it life, its life cycle in one year. And then you'll have a new generation of puzzly weeds the, the, the upcoming um, winter. And so annual weeds complete their life cycle in one year. Um, when you're trying to control annual weeds, the most susceptible stage to any kind of post-emergent herbicide will be during the seedling stage. You want to treat it before it starts to flower. Pre-emergent herbicides are also good at controlling annual weeds. So here are some examples of annuals. You'll have cool season annuals and you'll have warm season annuals. Examples of your warm season annuals are your chamber bitter, um, your spurge, your crabgrass. Examples of your cool season annuals are your um, Carolina geranium, annual bluegrass, your hairy bitter bittercress, your henbit, and your common chickweed. So your biennial is a second life cycle category of weed classification. Biennials will complete their life cycle in two years. The first year, the seeds will germinate and it will put out leaves and shoots, which is your vegetative growth. And in the second year, it will embark on reproductive growth which is when it puts out its flowers and then you have seed set and seed, seed dispersal. Examples of your biennials are your narrow leaf cudweed, your toad flax and your Carolina falls dandelion. It is important to know whether a leaf uh, weed is an annual or a biennial because 
if it's a biennial, you definitely want to treat it within that first year and prevent it from going to seed in the second year. So perennials are your third life cycle category of weeds. Perennials will live more than two years. And so for perennials, the weed that you saw this year is the same mother plant as the, as the weed you saw last year. And it will be the same mother plant that you will see next year if it's in the same location. We're not talking about a new generation that spread to a different location. But if you see that weed in the same location, if it's a perennial weed, it's the same plant that perpetually will set seed and um, spawn more weeds. It is the most difficult weed to control because a lot of times it will have either tubers or underground rhizomes or it might have woody tissue where it's going to be difficult for the herbicide to actually get a hold up and take control and so um, your perennial weeds are the most difficult weeds to control. Examples of your perennial weeds. Your, no, I'm sorry, these are, back up. These are not examples of your perennial weeds. These are just examples of weeds for identification. So let me just clarify that the weeds you're gonna see going forward will be in the category of either annual, biennial, or perennial. We're just showing you some close-ups of the weeds so that when you encounter them, you can identify them. Some of these pictures were taken by Stephen, so you'll see picture credits. Um, like I said at the beginning, as extension agents, we do share material, but we always give credit for um, material and pictures that were taken. Okay, so on the left, you'll see a close-up of your spurge. You will definitely know um, the spurges. Um, the center of the leaves tend to be a darker color than the, the margins of the leaf. And that, that's usually your key identifier for spurges. Um, your chamber bitter tends to have um, these spherical um, appendages on the base under the on the underside of the leaves. Your chickweed, I tend to think of chickweed as a rather delicate kind of weed. The stems tend to be very fragile. And um, I showed you your puzzly as well. There are actually two varieties of puzzly. Um, one is actually native to Brazil and one is native to Florida. Here is your henbit, and your henbit is easily identified because it has um, what we call opposite leaf arrangement, where you'll have more than one leaf at the, sa at the same node. And then your Florida betony is really difficult to control because it has underground tubers. So even though you have controlled the green portion of the plant, because there are underground tubers which store food reserves, the plant will be able to send up more shoots even after the green portion has been killed off by herbicides. Here um, on the left is an example of your purslane. And again, Purslane has fragile stems. Um, they're easily broken as opposed to say your spurge where if you try to pull spurge up, it will just break off and then it will actually leave the root behind. You also on the right is an example of your day flower. And remember I said that one of the telltale signs of spurge is that you'll have um, a darker coloration in the center of the leaves. The, when we're describing the growth habit of weeds, you will see something either described as prostrate, which means it crawls on the ground, 
or erect, which means it grows upright. It, it, it does not crawl. And so when you see um, a description saying this leaf has prostrate stems, you will know that you're not expecting to see a weed that has stems that grow upright. Okay. Dollarweed is another one of our favorite weeds to hate. Um, it can be quite difficult to control. You, you can definitely tell it's dollarweed by its very distinctive round shaped leaf and then it has scalloped leaf margins. So dollarweed is one of the most um, easily identified weeds. Here is your beggar stick, your Biden's alba. Biden's alba is an, a very important pollinator plant, um, which is why we have that picture on the left. So although it can be a nuisance in areas that we're trying to keep well manicured um, as, a, an, as a landscape, it is a, an important pollinator plant. And so sometimes we do wanna, want to make sure that we don't eradicate every single weed. Um, if there are areas that you can allow um, some weed types to go to flower, then it will be beneficial for pollinators. Here is your wild indigo. Um, you will know it's wild indigo, not just by the flower, but um, the stems are hairy. There are some grasses too that we can identify based on hairy stems. Um, and so when you send pictures in, Stephen talked about the digital diagnostics. When you send pictures in, we also need a picture of the stem because we want to see if where the leaves attach to the stem. Sometimes you'll have hairy ligules, L-I-G-U-L-E-S, that will help us to identify what kind of grass it is. Here is um, a close-up of your Cupid's shaving brush. It's a broadleaf. Um, it will be, it will, the stems will be hairy at the base, um, whereas at the top of the stem, it will be smooth. You can usually tell your Cupid's shape, shaving brush, the leaves tend to have a very distinctive, almost like a spade-like shape. But again, it's important to figure out what kind of weed you're trying to control because not all labels will be, not all product labels will list um, the kind of weed that you're trying to control. So it's very important to know what it is you're controlling because like I said, nobody has money to burn. Here's your matchweed. There are some people who think matchweed make, makes a really great ground cover. Um, but again, the jury's out on that. There are some people who don't want anything growing on their lawn except lawn. Um, but it's considered a weed if it's growing somewhere you don't want it to grow. It, it has prostrate stems, so you'll see crawling on the ground. Um, and then you will have um, the description of the leaf. If you can see my pointer here, the margins of the leaves are toothed or we call it um, serrated margins. So now it's time for poll number one and I'm going to launch poll number one and let's see if everybody's still awake. Michelle, I think they're sleeping. Great, awesome, they're awake. Keep going guys, keep going. Great. And if you can't see question three, just scroll down. And I'll give it a few more seconds just to get everybody's votes in. Okay, great. 
So the answers. Weeds are classified as broadleaf grasses and sedges. That is correct. Weeds complete their life cycle in one year. That's annual weeds complete their life cycle in one year. That's correct. And perennial weeds live longer than two years. Okay, so let's keep going. And I joke with you about being awake during the weed science session. When I was in college and at the end of one semester, you see the classes that are coming up for the next semester. And just before we were gonna start our semester on weed science, everyone in our class was thinking, we have to take a whole semester of weed science. That is crazy. Who wants to do one whole science learning about weeds? And then we also thought, because our, um, our professor had a PhD in weed science, and we we're like, oh my gosh, why would you want to do a PhD in weed science? But when we were done with that course, we were like, thank God for weed scientists. Oh my gosh, they are the saviors of our planet. And I'll explain to you um, in a little while while we go into her herbicide technology, why we weed scientists are pretty much our saviors. All right. Hey, so now Marjorie, we're going to, uh-huh. Did you launch the poll? Because I, I, gave, I gave you host privileges and it took them away from me. So I can't launch your poll for you. Yes, I launched it and everybody answered. Okay. I just saw a guy chat saying that he didn't he get could, the question. So He didn't. Okay. That's okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. We had like 50 people respond. So Perfect. I don't know if he was having trouble. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. So now we're going to talk about grasses and just some examples of... Um, our favorite grasses to hate. Um, so on the left, you'll see crabgrass. It's really difficult to control in St. Augustine because many of the herbicides that are labeled to control crabgrass will also beat up St. Augustine. St. Augustine tends to be sensitive to a lot of grass killers and so it can be difficult to control to find a product that will effectively control crabgrass in St. Augustine and while we're going through if you want to type in the chat box I know Michelle has access to the chat box while I'm focused on the presentation but if you guys have any down and dirty tricks for controlling weeds um, that you've you know seen or done or you know been there done that tried it you know feel free to type it in the chat and we can have a discussion um towards the end because i know that people who have to control weeds for a living sometimes you know they realize that wow i came across this really great product it has to be labeled for the grass though um or the site that you're using it on um but you know we learn from each other as we go along so feel free to type it in the chat box. All right. So on the right um, is, your, is a picture of goosegrass. And for people who, you know, they're not accustomed to seeing these grasses up close and personal every day, it can be a little tricky to differentiate between the two. I tend to think that the crabgrass blades are a little wider than your goose goosegrass blades, but you can definitely tell the difference based on the inflorescence. If you can see my pointer here, the inflorescence on the crabgrass is not going to look the same as the inflorescence on the goosegrass. And Michelle, um, you know, since you're monitoring the chat box, you can feel free to pipe in if there's something I need to grab from the chat box. Okay. My mouse is behaving weird, guys, so just give me a minute. I'm clicking and it's not doing what I want to do. Let's go. Someone did um, put in Pro Avista St. Augustine Roundup for crabgrass. And um, so basically there's that St. Augustine turf variety Pro Vista that um, is a Scott's product. And if you use Scott's herbicides on it, you can blanket apply and um, this 
person is saying that it works for crabgrass to remove it, just blanket applying on there. But okay. you have to have you have to have the Pro Vista St. Augustine in place to do that. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm not I'm not trying to eat into Susan's time, but I'm glad you brought that up because you do have to know that it's Pro Vista you have. And the other thing too is that that's prob that the the fact that it was so difficult to treat crabgrass in St. Augustine with grass herbicides, that was one of the impetuses to develop a variety of St. Augustine that you could actually use grass herbicides on and it would not beat up your St. Augustine. So that was one of the impetuses to actually come up with a, 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 a grass herbicide tolerant St. Augustine type. But um, in the fertilizer CEU um, webinar we had last week, Michelle brought up a good point about blanket application of herbicides um, contributing to herbicide resistance. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So you definitely want to um, be, be aware that when you're applying herbicides, you want to switch up your um, the herbicide categories. We'll talk about that in a bit because you don't want to um, have your weeds become resistant to, resistant to herbicides. Okay, so Alexander grass, um, you definitely know you have Alexander grass because it's huge. When, when I say huge, not like elephant grass huge, but it's usually larger than say your crab grass or your, um, your goose grass. It tends to grow um, in air, well, I would say almost closer to natural areas, um, but your Alexander grass is more easily I, differentiated between your crabgrass and your goose grass. And again, I just want to do a plug for your extension office. If you send us pictures, we can um, send it out to our weed specialists. We have weed specialists at our research center in Immokalee and at our cattle research center in Ona. Um, we also have weed specialists in Gainesville. And so if we don't know the answer, chances are we know somebody who does know the answer. So feel free to send us pictures if you're trying to identify weeds and you're not sure which kind of weed you're trying to control. Um, here is an example of your wild Bermuda grass. Um, it tends to be fairly drought tolerant. And so when other grasses are dying because there's no irrigation or it's um, we're in a drought, your wild Bermuda grass will survive. And this is because if you see my pointer here, um, it, it, it has underground um, rhizomes. It also propagates by runners, which are above ground stems. And those will act as food reserves when the grass blades die off because of lack of moisture the rhizomes will act as energy reserves and be able to put out new shoots once irrigation or rainfall resumes. So here are your sedges, examples of your sedges. And your sedges are perennials and so they will keep putting out seeds year after year. Um, that's one of the reasons why they're so difficult to control. On the left, you'll have your purple nut sedge. And on your right, it looks, it's kind of hard to tell because I, I wouldn't need to see it really close up, but it looks like yellow nut sedge. Okay, so you have your globe sedge and your globe sedge, um, the seed heads tend to have shorter nodes. And so I'm going to go back to your purple nut sedge you will see that the nodes between each portion is a little longer and so it looks almost like a fan. Whereas in your globe sedge, the seed head, the nodes between the portions are shorter and so it looks almost like a, a tuft or a ball. So that's how you can differentiate between your globe sedge and your other sedges. Having mouse issues again, but we will get there. <laughs> okay, so um, just some more information on your globe sedges. 
the seeds are clustered, like I said, um, then the, the, the seed head looks more rounded than your other sedges. And your yellow nut sedge, you can see the seed head does not look round, it looks more like a fan. Some more close-up pictures of your purple nut sedge. You'll see that it has a darker color than your yellow nut sedge. And here we have your Kylinga. This is a close-up of the seed head. And then this is what it looks like when it's growing. Um, so it tends to grow like in clumps or mats. And then usually what you'll see is just below the seed head, you'll see a group of three leaves coming up. If you can see my pointer, one, two, and the leaf in the back. All right, so now we're going to talk about how um, herbicides are classified. They can be classified as pre-emergent or post-emergent based on the life cycle of the plant that it attacks. They can be classified as selective or non-selective based on the type of weeds it will control. And then it can be classified as a contact herbicide or a systemic herbicide based on the mode of action. Okay, so your selective herbicides will control only certain types of plants. So a broadleaf herbicide is a selective herbicide. A grass herbicide is a selective herbicide. Sedge hammer that will kill sedges is a selective herbicide. A non-selective herbicide will kill most plants unless the plant is resistant. A non-selective plant, a non-selective herbicide will kill anything that's green, any green tissue. And so like your glyphosate is considered a non-selective herbicide Anything green that you put glyphosate on, chances are it will die unless the plant is resistant to glyphosate. Your selectivity can also be affected by the rate that you use, your timing, and your application method. Um, there are some pre-emergent herbicides that if you apply them at a different rate will also have post-emergent um, control. And then your, here are some examples of your non-selective herbicides. Okay, so herbicides can be classified as contact or systemic based on how they work to kill a plant. So your contact herbicide will kill only the part of the plant that it touches. Um, and so you can use them to control your annuals, your biennials, things that tend not to get woody or things that don't have anything underground because a contact herbicide will only kill the part of the plant that it touches. And there is an example is your diquat. Your systemic herbicide, also called translocated because translocation is a term we use to describe how nutrients and water move throughout the plant. And so your systemic or your translocated herbicides are absorbed by the plant part that you apply the herbicide to and then it's carried throughout the plant. So if you applied it to the leaves, the herbicide will get translocated to the roots. If you applied it to the roots, the herbicide will get translocated to the leaves. If you applied it to the stem, herbicide will get translocated. And so we call it systemic because it goes through the entire plant system. This is the type of herbicide that would be most effective against perennial weeds because perennial weeds either have woody tissue that is hard for um, herbicides to actually absorb into or it will have underground food reserves and so you want to use something that will get translocated throughout the plant. You want to use a systemic herbicide. You're not going to get quick knockdown of your um, 
weeds with a systemic herbicide because it takes time to get translocated throughout the entire plant. And then this is just a diagram showing you how the systemic herbicide actually works. If you can see my pointer here, you will apply, if you apply it to the growing point, even though it has underground food reserves, the plant will translocate that herbicide to every part that ha that's connected and you will get control because of translocation and not because of contact. So this is just a comparison chart of your pre-emergent herbicides versus your post-emergent herbicides. Pre means before, emergent means comes up. And so your pre-emergent, you have to apply it before the weeds come up out of the ground, before the weeds emerge. Um, Pre-emergents will act on the seeds and prevent seeds from germinating, or it will prevent shoot development and root development once germination occurs. So the process of germination is the embryo inside the seeds, once it, it gets enough moisture, it will grow a shoot, which is what you'll see above the ground, and it will grow a root. Pre-emergent herbicides can either prevent germination from occurring or they can inhibit root development or shoot development. And so you wanna apply your pre-emergent to control anything that has not yet emerged. Your post-emergent, post means after, and again, emergent means come up out of the ground. Your post-emergent is applied after um, the plants have emerged. So you will apply it to any, anything that's above the ground. And here are again are your, some, some examples of your post-emergent herbicides. So you definitely want to make sure that you are following the appropriate timing um, recommendations for either your pre-emergence or your post-emergence. Because pre-emergence um, control the process of germination and what happens immediately after germination, you do need to have moisture in the soil for a pre-emergent to work because if there's no moisture in the soil, germination does not work. And if germination does not work, then your pre-emergent won't work. Um, here are, here's just a breakdown of, here's just a breakdown of how your pre-emergents work. Um, they won't work well on perennial weeds. They are usually good for um, controlling weed seeds for up to 12 weeks, but you want to follow the label. The label is the law. So whatever the label says um, is the proper interval for applying your pre-emergence. You want to follow that label. You also don't want to use a pre-emergent if you're going to be establishing turf by seeding, because again, pre-emergence inhibit germination and the, the process is associated with germination. So any seeds you put down, even if you put down turf seed, the pre-emergent will also affect that, okay? Um, and this is just a chart that talks about the proper temperatures that are required for pre-emergent um, application. Again, germination is not going to occur if temperatures are low. And so putting out a pre-emergent herbicide when the temperatures are low means you're burning money um, because if it's supposed to act on germination and there's no germination, then you've just wasted your pre-emergent herbicide. So you wanna pay particular attention to the label. The label will tell you, do not apply when temperatures are lower than X degrees. Do not apply when temperatures are higher than Y degrees. Again, follow the label recommendations. Post-emergent application, I can't tell you how many times we've gotten questions in um, from persons saying, well, I sprayed this herbicide and it didn't work. And one of the first questions we ask is, was it listed on the label that this herbicide should work on this herb, on this weed? And they said, yes, it was labeled for that particular weed. Then we will say, but you have to pay particular attention to what's happening in the plant when you apply the herbicide. 
because there are some herbicides that are designed to only work on actively growing plants. You will see that's on the label, only apply to actively growing plants. This means that the plant has to be in the vegetative state. It has to be actively putting out leaves or shoots because if it's not actively putting out leaves or shoots, that herbicide will not work. If the weed is in the vegetative state where it is putting out flowers and setting seed, then herbicides labeled for actively growing plants will not work on a, on a weed that is flowering or seeding. When you're applying post-emergent herbicides, the stage of the weed that is most susceptible will be the young stage. They'll say the seedling stage or the three leaf stage. Sometimes you'll see on a herbicide label, do not apply to weeds that are taller than eight inches. There's a reason for that. The herbicide is not gonna work as well. Um, you wanna avoid application under these particular conditions. You wanna avoid applying herbicides when the weeds are under drought stress because there are some herbicides that need to be translocated, which means they need to, be, they need to move through the, the plant system. If the plant is under drought stress, translocation rates are low and so it's not moving fluid around the plant as much as it should and so your herbicide is not going to go to where you want it to go. We talked about if your weed is producing seed heads, the herbicide might not work. Also, if you're going to be mowing the area, you should not apply systemic herbicides just prior because systemic herbicides need time to translocate through the, the, the plant system. So this is just an example of what we mean when we talk about actively growing weeds. These are the various stages of plant growth. You have your seed, it germinates, it grows into a seedling, it has a shoot, it has a root, um, then it puts out leaves and more shoots and it continues to grow. At this point, it's considered the vegetative stage of the plant. The minute it starts to put out flowers, it is no longer in its vegetative state. It is in its reproductive state. And so it is putting out seeds. It is less focused on growing leaves and shoots and making chlorophyll. It's more focused on making flowers. And so once it makes flowers, it sets seeds, it matures. If it's an annual weed, it will die. If it's a perennial weed, it will just go on and keep um, doing its thing until the next season. Okay, so this is the stage at which weeds are most vulnerable to post-emergent herbicides. Okay. You want to get the weeds before they grow too large and you definitely want to control the weed before it gets to this stage because here you're looking at thousands of seeds. Not only are you looking at thousands of seeds, your herbicide might not work if you apply a post-emergent at this stage. Um, when you're talking about controlling woody perennials, you want to control them prior to when they put down a lot of woody tissue because then controlling it is gonna be difficult, okay? So we're gonna look a little bit at the factors that affect plant growth because these factors will affect whether your herbicide will work or not. We mentioned drought stress because the plant needs water to move nutrients around in the plant system. The plant needs water to be able to have high translocation rates. If you apply your herbicide under drought conditions, your herbicide will not be as effective. This is just a cross section of what your leaf looks like. And again, when your plant is under drought stress, it will close the pores. Each leaf will have pores on the underside of the leaf. We call those pores stoma and 
if the plant is undergoing drought stress, it will close those pores and sometimes herbicides that you apply to the leaves will not be absorbed quickly. The temperature um, affects plant growth. Low temperatures usually mean a lower rate of photosynthesis, which also usually mean, means um, that your herbicide might not work as effectively under low temperatures. If, they, if there's high humidity, your herbicides might also um, not work as effectively because under um, low, depending on the low or high humidity, your plant pores will close as well. Um, when there is high humidity, evapotranspiration tends to be lower and so translocation rates are also lower. If there is low light, because plants require light to photosynthesize, if there are low light, if there's low light or foggy conditions, you will have lower photosynthetic rates, and so your herbicide might not work as well. Okay, um, so we're going to look a little bit at how the herbicide will move through the plant tissues. So just like how we have vascular tissue, we have blood vessels. Plants also have vessels in their vascular tissue. They have xylem vessels, which transport water from the roots to the leaves. And they have phloem vessels, which transport food from the leaves where it's made to the roots. Herbicides work, herbicides that are systemic will depend on the xylem and the phloem to move herbicides around in the plant, okay? Um, most herbicides that are applied to the soil will move through the xylem, and most herbicides that are applied to leaves will move through the phloem. You'll see on this slide a mention of the cut stump treatment, which I'm going to go over in the next slide. When you're trying to control perennials that have woody tissue, it is generally recommended that you do the cut stump treatment where you remove the bark and you apply the herbicide directly to the internal tissue so that you have better chances of it translocating throughout the plant. So you want to make sure that you apply the herbicide to the cambium because the cambium is the growing point for your xylem vessels and your flowing phloem vessels. Okay, so now we're going to take pole two. Let me see if they're still awake and it's launched. Okay, great. Keep going, guys. Just waiting for a few more people. Okay, so there are your answers. Um, false, selective herbicides will not kill all weeds. Pre-emergent herbicides prevent seed germination and co contact herbicides are effective only on the part of the plant that is sprayed, that is true. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly go through the remaining slides. I don't have many slides left. I'm want to get um, Susan in on time. Okay, having mouse issues, but we will get there. <laughs> okay, all right. So herbicides can also be categorized as persistent or non-persistent. Your persistent herbicides will remain active for an extended period of time, which is why it is very important to pay attention to the label. If the label says only apply every three months, only apply every three months, regardless of 
what you're seeing in terms of results. Your non-persistent herbicides are short-lived in the environment and so they will degrade quickly. Um, either they get adsorbed to the soil particles and so they're not um, available to the plant or microorganisms will break them down quickly, okay? And here are just some examples of your persistent herbicides and some examples of your non-persistent herbicides, okay? Again, the label is a law. You want to pay specific attention to the spraying interval or the application interval periods that are on your labels. Um, I did promise I would talk to you a little bit about herbicide resistance. You want to make sure that you're looking at your mode of action. Your mode of action will talk about whether it's a photosynthesis inhibitor, whether it's a protein synthesis inhibitor, amino acid inhibitor. And so you want to make sure that when you rotate your pesticides to prevent resistance, you are rotating active ingredients because different active ingredients do different things. Um, so you have your group one herbicides and your group one herbicides will block various enzymes. Um, this particular enzyme is important in lipid synthesis. And so you wanna make sure that if you applied a group one herbicide at this point, you're applying something other than a group one herbicide at the next application. So here, hopefully you can see it. This is just an example. None of us have shares in Syngenta. Um, this is just an example. We're not promoting any particular product, but if you can see my pointer here, this is an herbicide in group 27. So you want to pay close attention to the group numbers on your herbicide label. And this right here is the reason why weed scientists are the saviors of the world because it is the weed scientists and the weed scientist society of america that came up with the group classification for various herbicides to help us figure out how to avoid herbicide resistance and so if you ever meet a weed scientist you shake his hand you buy him coffee I would tell you to buy him a beer, but we're being recorded. So you buy him a cup of coffee because he is making your life easy. Er. Your time is... Very yeah, I have like two more sides on it. I'm, I know my time is... Okay, so rushing through. Once you apply your herbicides, you can't unring a bell. You can't unapply it. So please keep it out of water, buddies. Make sure you're not putting it anywhere it's not supposed to go. You have to watch out for a drift because... What you're seeing here is herbicide injury. They were targeting a particular plant, not these, and they it drifted and now these plants are dead. So you wanna make sure that you um, keep your herbicides where they're supposed to. And these are just some symptoms of um, phytotoxic reactions to herbicides. And with that, I am then I'll uh, maybe I'll skip that part unless things improve as as we move forward. Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about turf grass and turf grass disease, and I will kind of mark on the screen a little bit. Can you see this? Yes. Yes, we can see that. Okay, so I <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about warm season turf grass species, um, some contributors to decline, disease basics, turf grass disease, five steps to diagnose. I do have some interactive stuff in here, so if you can type into the chat box. I'm not going to be able to see the answers in the chat box evidently though, so that's that's um, a little bit of an impediment here, but I guess um, Marguerite and, and uh, Michelle, you can let me know what you see when that comes up. Yes, uh, we will. So, okay. So turf grass, there it's the family Poaceae. There's uh, 7,500 species, but we only manage about 40 species as turf grass. So that's a very few number of the entire um, species that we actually manage. So it works really well as a uh, uniform long-lived ground cover, which is why we use it in so many different applications. And it can tolerate traffic depending on the species and those low mowing heights of usually 
um, three inches or less. Susan, we can see you now. Your video okay. is up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, not that anybody needs to see me, but I, I have a couple things I'll share at some point. Um, let me see. See, I don't really like being in this full screen because I have to advance slides a little differently. Okay, so there's um, different types of ways that, that turf grass grows, so those growth patterns. So we have rhizo rhizomaceous, bunch, and stoloniferous. And so when we look at rhizomaceous, what kind of turf grass would that be? Does anyone throw that into your chat box? And then bunch, throw that in. I guess we'll talk about rhizomaceous first. So both Bermuda grass and zoysia grass um, are rhizomaceous, but they're also stoloniferous. So that means that they have those above and below ground runners. Um, that's what makes them a little bit more drought tolerant because with that underground growth, it kind of saves that part of the tissue from drying out if the soil is not dried down too low. Um, the bunch grass is going to be your bahia grass. So you know that bahia grass grows in a bunch. It tends to thin out if it's overwatered, over fertilized. Um, and then we have our St. Augustine, which is purely a solid stoloniferous grass. Okay. Susan, we did have some people chime in, um, Bermuda, bahia as okay. well in okay. the chat box. Great. I'm sorry I can't, I'm not being able to, um, and I have a couple people raise their hand. I see that there's coming up. This is really different. It, I, I don't know if this is the Zoom update, but the raised hands coming up funky on my screen. Anyway, so here we go. So there are turf grasses. We have cool season, warm season, and then we have transition areas. So our cool season grasses are those grasses that are going to thrive um, in cool freezing winters and hot summers. So not to say that they look great in cool freezing winters, but they'll survive that freezing temperatures. Our warm season grasses, we grow down here, won't survive those cool, those cold freezing temperatures. Um, roughly, you know, we're looking at Virginia, North Carolina, north of there, and especially, you know, New England, upper Midwest, Plains, Northern California, etc. And it's going to look best in the summer when those temperatures are between 65 and 80 degrees. So if you are concerned about um, climate change and warming temperatures, even in the northern areas, some of those cool season grasses may struggle a little bit. So we've got some examples on the bottom of what those cool season grasses are. The transition zone is doesn't have its own class of turf grass specifically, but it's where some warm season grasses do well and some cool seasons do. And sometimes you'll see some areas, some uh, golf courses, sports fields, they'll be doing a mix of those. Um, and this is where, of course, in, in our area, you'll see overseeding of perennial ryegrass, which is a cool season grass on some of our sports fields and golf courses um, during the winter months when it gets cool so we can maintain some of that cover as well as the green color that folks like to see. So our warm season grasses, they're best adopted for this tropical, subtropical environment that we have here. That optimal growth, 75 to 95 degrees. So that's our spring, summertime. Um, and the geographic range is restricted by that intolerance to the severe cold. So they don't do well up in that, that northern part of the United States. So the growth naturally slows between October and March due to cooler nights and, and less sunlight. Um, and so it requires less water and little to no fertilizer during that time from about mid-November to March. And we, we really try to encourage our homeowners not to do a lot of irrigation and fertilization during those months. It's a different story when you're looking at the wear and tear on year-round um, sports turf fields that get a lot of, of wear. They do have to manage with fertilizers and different practices, aeration and such year-round um, when they're getting so much wear on them. Um, but in general, for our, for our homeowners and such were saying, you know, please don't fertilize during those times because that energy that has been stored up during this, this um, vigorous growth during the summertime, that stored energy needs to go to, to the root health so that we have a good looking lawn again the next year. Okay, so looking at some of the different types of, of turf grasses, so Bermuda grass, um, it's the most common warm season task, uh, turf grass in the world. It is well adapted to a lot of different environments um, and climates in Florida soil. It's excellent wear, drought, and salt tolerant. It establishes rapidly. It's able to outcompete most weed species and it'll outcompete St. Augustine grass too. So we have a lot of issues with folks that bought ho homes on golf courses and they put St. Augustine in the lawn, but they butt up against Bermuda grass and that Bermuda grass eventually starts creeping into the zoysia grass and taking over. Um, so common varieties are available as seed, sod, or plugs. 
And then the cultivated um, varieties are only available as solder plugs. Um, so the disadvantages, it can require a lot of maintenance. So maybe not the best turf grass for a lawn. Um, the, it is intolerant of dense shade, extreme cold, very wet soils. Um, so we do need to make sure that Bermuda grass is put in primarily full sun areas. Um, there is a lot of issues with some insects disease and, and especially nematodes. Um, it does have aggressive growth that'll foster some thatch buildup. So verticutting, again, is, is a lot of times necessary on um, the sports fields that use that. Um, has medium to poor cold tolerance and, and again, as I said, very poor shade tolerance. Um, for sports fields, it's the best choice turf for the warm season athletic fields. It's very resistant to wear, will recover really rapidly from damage by cleats and traffic, given that little bit of phosphorus and, and potassium and nitrogen fertilization. It does need to receive full sunlight, but there's no other grass that's going to respond as quickly to that, that damage that's caused by a lot of wear. Um, the biggest weakness is that dormancy following a frost, and that's why I, I spoke just a moment ago about that overseeding um, with some of the cooler se season worm grasses so that, that it keeps that cover and um, the green color. Um, so there are different cultivars available, but they don't produce viable seed. Some of the most common ones used on sports fields are going to be your Tifway, Tif Sport, and Bullseye. Um, again, under ideal growing conditions, they can be grown from sprigs and cover an area in about 12 weeks with, with the right conditions. Um, and Tifway is that most widely used hybrid Bermuda grass on southern athletic fields. Hey, Susan? Yes. Someone wants to know why do we have fertilizer restrictions during the time the grass needs it most then? Okay, that's, I can't give you a, a really quick answer to that. Um, you know, the, the research that, that we have from University of Florida, as well as the other universities that we work with throughout the South, LSU, um, Georgia, Auburn, Texas A&M, they all support um, fertilizing during the growing season. However, the growing season is also our rainy season. And um, so there is some concern that that fertilizer that we apply around a heavy rain might be more readily leached or run off. Um, and so that, that's a whole nother um, presentation, I would think. Um, so we don't, at University of Florida, we say that, that if you're fertilizing correctly with the right amount at the right time, there's having fertilizer restrictions in the summertime are really not a wise choice, but there is, as Michelle mentioned earlier, there, there's a lot of politics involved with that and a lot of different environmental organizations that may or may not be willing to um, accept the research. Um, so th there's not a good reason, there's not a good reason why, but there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> So, so I was hoping um, if, if anyone out there that manages sports field can, can let me know if you use any of these cultivars of Bermuda grass and just if you do the raise your hand, um, I'll start seeing the hands come up versus it being in the chat. Um, it's kind of give me an idea if you've heard of any of these and if you're using any of these cultivars. It'd be interesting to know. So I got two people so far. Well, that's good to know. Another person. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. Bahia grass is another one of our warm season grasses. It's mainly used in utility areas and roadsides. Uh, I would say, unfortunately, our Water Star certification is saying is is uh, really promoting Bahia grass as a lawn grass. And my experience is, as a lawn grass, it tends to be overwatered, over fertilized, and it thins, becomes very weedy. We get a lot of erosion and dirt and weeds. Um, so, but we do have a new cultivar of Bahia grass that is being researched, hasn't been released, that's going to have a much tighter clumping pattern, fewer seed heads, lower seed heads, and a better green color. So hopefully that will be released sometime in the near future. The good thing about it is it is tolerant to those sandy infertile soils, so that's why it grow so well on roadsides and such with no maintenance whatsoever. Um, and then as soon as it gets, we start getting rains, it greens up. When we have a drought, it browns out, but it seems to do really well in those types of locations. Um, the thing that people don't like is that those abundance of seed heads. So if we want it to reseed, we've got to let those seed heads uh, form, but then the viability of the seed is very low. So even that as a philosophy for homeowners doesn't work that well. It's susceptible to mole crickets. It is used in some um, some sport fields areas um, and those those lights on the sport fields can attract the mole crickets and we can have have to do some management for that. It's used a lot in homeowner associations 
in um, in like little soccer fields and that sort of thing and seems to do okay but then of course they don't manage it with with doing any kind of aeration for compaction so kind of a bad thing. The seashore pest palum is a bahia grass um, and it was um, specifically cultivated for golf uh, greens tees fairways. At one point they were trying to market it for homes but the research has shown that it just is not a good grass for homeowner areas. Um, Zoysia grass, the empire, uh, which is the coarse leaf type, is one that's gotten more and more popular, uh, especially for homeowners. Um, it is maintained with quite a bit less nitrogen than St. Augustine, about half as much. Um, it is mowed lower. Um, you can use a rotary mower on it. It has moderate shade tolerance and establishes quite quickly. Um, some of the zoysia grass can be pretty aggressive and it can also go into your neighbor's uh, if you have it can can leap over into your neighbor's St. Augustine grass. It's heat and drought tolerant and so when we say drought tolerant we don't mean that it needs less water. It needs about the same amount of water as St. Augustine to look good um, but in the event that we have water restrictions that don't allow us to water um, it's more likely to come back. So if it goes during a period of drought without water for two or so weeks, it's more likely to come back because it physiologically shuts itself down. Whereas St. Augustine grass is not really capable of doing that. And if it goes like two, three weeks without water, it's more likely to die and not come back. So that's what we mean by that, that drought tolerance. Um, it is slow to establish it tends to shut down and lose that green color quicker in the fall when we start getting cool nights in St. Augustine and it takes longer to green up in the springtime. So we tell our clients, be patient with zoysia grass because it's not going to green up as quickly. Um, and again, it's, it's susceptible to a few different insects, hunting billbugs, large patch, etc. Um, and then St. Augustine grass, which is the most grown and installed in Florida, uh, especially, you know, homeowners, common areas, that sort of thing. It's pretty tolerant of a wide range of soil pH. Some of the cultivars have good shade tolerance. I wouldn't say all of them. It's relative. Um, when we say shade tolerance, it still needs five to six hours of full sun a day. Does establish qu quickly from sod and grows vigorously. It's got good salt tolerance. So when we do have hurricanes and such and some flooding uh, with salt water or we have a little bit of salt water intrusion in well water um, and the salts in, in reclaimed water, it seems to tolerate that better than the other turf grasses. Um, again, it does need that supplemental water when we have that, that very hot dry periods. Uh, doesn't have good wear tolerance, can form thatch, intolerant of, of cold and then for most cultivars, chinch bugs can be difficult. Now, since we've been rotating those mode of actions that Marguerite spoke about, we, send, we tend to have a lot better control of chinch bugs. I've not really seen a whole lot of um, outbreaks of chinch bugs in St. Augustine grass in the last few years. So I think our, our uh, folks doing the, the, um, the maintenance are doing a good job with that. Last year, we had chinch bug outbreaks in Bermuda grass, which was unusual. I hadn't seen that. So I had some of the, um, the sports field folks calling me and saying, what's up with the chinch bugs in Bermuda grass? Um, and it was the, my first year that I had been exposed to it, although some of them had, had seen that in the past. Um, the other disadvantage is that lack of herbicides for grassy weed control. Um, if you get some of the just the regular varieties. So our standard cultivars, um, Poratam is our most widely installed grass in Florida. So, um, so that of course it's not tolerant of a lot of different herbicides for post-emergent weed control. It's really good with a lot of the pre-emergents. So we have a couple of new cultivars of St. Augustine out there. One of them is Citra Blue. That is a University of Florida release. Um, it has a little bit of a blue-green color. It's really dense, compact. It, it, it uh, fills in pretty quick. That look, picture is actually a little plot in my yard where I just had a few strips that I put in. Uh, it was after the FNGLA show last fall, so maybe in November, and by this spring it had filled in pretty well. So, so I thought it did quite well. It does have a lower mowing height, and in fact that mowing height that I've got on that slide is incorrect. My apologies. The mowing height is about three inches on that. Um, it's a little lower than Floratam. Um, it's got better shade tolerance than Floratam. Um, right now, the chinch bug studies are underway, um, and uh, so we're not sure how that's going to pan out. A lot of times, our cultivars, initially, we say, oh, it's, it's chinch bug resistant, and then five years down the road, it's like, well, no, it's not so resistant. And we we kind of find out down the road that it's a little bit different. 
Um, so it does look, it does so far, has outperformed Bortam or been more resistant to take all root rot, large patch and gray leaf spot, which is very common on um, Bortam. The other new cultivar, which is a release by, um, released by, is it Bayer? Am I right about that? Scott. Is it I'm Scott's? Right on Scott's. My side. Scott's. Scott. Scott's. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it was bred for weed control, and, and Marguerite spoke to this in reference to a question, in reference to, I think Patrick Meyer had a comment about it. It is glyphosate tolerant, um, so you can treat things like Bermuda grass, torpedo grass, signal grass, and of course crabgrass. Um, it has a denser canopy than Floratam, so it's a little bit more competitive. Um, they're saying that it cuts mowing in half. It only needs to be mowed about every four to six weeks due to its more horizontal habit of growing. Um, I haven't really had any feedback from folks using it to, to say, yes, that's true. Um, it'd be great for landscapers because it can free them up to do things other than just run a mower every week um, when they're at sites. It has moderate shade tolerance, so we'll see how that goes. Um, the one thing that, that is, we have to be concerned about is, is the weed species resistance. So we don't recommend doing blanket applications of Roundup on this grass. Um, so things like crabgrass, it's still better to rely on your pre-emergent controls and then do, just do spot treating of those escapes. So those few seeds that do go ahead and germinate um, to use spot treating for those. If we start doing broad spectrum um, blanket applications, we will probably end up with weed species resistance. And I wouldn't be surprised in, in areas that have a lot of crabgrass pressure that if we're using a lot of, of glyphosate that we're going to end up very quickly with some resistance. So just be cautious of that. And then when we do have stolen creep that goes into um, landscape beds and stuff, it, unless you're going to hand pull or cut out, you're going to need to use um, diquat or um, fluazoflop um, for that, that stolen creep. So it just brings a couple more chemistries into your toolbox when you go out in the field. Okay, this is just showing us generally, you know, here's Bermuda grass way out here in the sun. And here we have our, our you know, kind of moderately um, shade tolerant grasses back here, um, zoysia grass and some of the St. Augustines. So this kind of gives you an idea how they do. Okay, so Starling, we're ready for those first three poll questions. Okay, so there should be three questions there for y'all to answer, and we'll take about 30 seconds or so to do those. Okay, it looks like we've got the majority of folks have um, chimed in on, on that poll. So on that first question, worm season grasses, they grow optimally at that 75 to 95 degrees. So that was about 60% of folks got that right. So just keep that in mind for the future. That most commonly grown and installed turf grass in Florida is St. Augustine. So I had about 86% of folks got that right. And then the best turf grass choice for sports fields is um, Bermuda grass and there's about 67 percent and of course you know that may be kind of um, uh, up to the the turf manager may think yeah it doesn't work in my situation so you can get some variations that way okay so we'll go ahead and move on and my screen is frozen so it is not letting me advance there okay. we go okay got it <laughs> Okay, so contributors to decline. So we want to talk a little bit about disease and why things, why turf grass has problems with diseases. So they're more susceptible to disease and pest infest infestation when it is already stressed and it has less ability to persist and do well when we have disease and pest pressure. So we may have to require more inputs to overcome stress in order to manage the diseases that may have been brought on by that stress in the 
to begin with. So um, all of those combinations of the cultural practices um, can reduce the environmental stress, disease, and, and pest pressure. So when we look at cultural and environmental factors, we're going to look at things that we have no control over, things like weather, temperature, you know, temperature, rain, humidity, dew, sunlight, day length, and you just have to keep those things in mind as to the timing of when we do certain pre-emergent or um, preventative type applications. You know, the timing of the year is going to be really important for those. Um, we'll have microclimates like shade, Air, how much air is moving around, soil type, drainage, and, and, tr and traffic. Um, and then our, our what happens in a microclimate, we may have increased traffic. And then our management, how we mow, are we scalping, are we mowing at the right height? Um, how are we fertilizing, managing that irrigation by the, by the season that we're in, and then doing any kind of cultivation that we might need to do, such as aeration or verticutting. Okay, so traffic is a big one, especially, I would say, especially for sports uh, fields, they get a lot of soil compaction, you get that shoot tissue injury, um, scuffing, abrasion, and tearing, um, and then you end up with that compaction having limited root growth and viability. So, so they do have to um, employ a lot more management practices than we do in homeowner or common area HOA properties with managing that compaction. And pe people will say, well, how, when should I, when should I do aeration? And we say, well, it's nice to say when you're doing a budget, oh, we need to do it three times a year. But a lot of that really depends on the use of your field. I mean, you need to do it when it needs it and you need to do it before it's bare ground. Um, so, so it's kind of sometimes it's difficult when you have counties um, and cities and municipalities pressuring you to do more and more use of fields but you don't get that time to, um, to do the maintenance you need and give it a little bit of a rest in between. Um, it's nice that if you're able to do things like aeration and some management to give that field uh, maybe a 10, to two, 10 day to two week rest between playing again, but that's not always what they allow us to do. So things that we can do by relieving, relieve, relieving compaction, managing that irrigation, reducing the traffic if we can, um, if you can mow higher, it's great, but that's not necessarily always feasible. And then that fertility management. Um, so that's why a lot of our, not all, a lot, but through our fertilizer ordinances, our sports fields and golf courses have exemptions to the fertilizer um, ordinances because of the wear that they have. They do need to do some very different fertility management than we do in homeowner situations. So one of the things that we look at in urban areas is, is this kind of thing. So we talk about why things don't do well and what kind of stress can we induce. So this is just a typical new neighborhood being built. On this picture in the lower right, we've got three different types of soil thrown out here that they've put in here, and then they're going to slap sod on top of that and expect it all to grow evenly. On this top picture, we've got an area that's left that was the mixing and cutting of the concrete. So it's probably gonna be uh, very alkaline right there from that concrete residue and they didn't mitigate that. Down here, we've got an area that's um, got poor drainage. They didn't do anything about that. They'll come in, even this out and just throw a little sod on top. And then we may have some disease issues due to this poor drainage area here. And you can see they've got that micro irrigation sitting there and the irrigation heads are in. So they are ready to go to just slap that sod down on top. And we wonder why we have problems. So in urban areas, when we have poor soils, some of the things we can do to help with um, some of the disease and stress pressures is do a two inch aeration and one half inch um, compost top dressing of a, a good quality compost that's been tested for the nitrogen carbon ratios and such. And I know with University of Florida, we're doing quite a lot of research on that and they are using the command compost. It's not, this is not a endorsement of command. It's just, you know, who, who they have available and close to the sites that they are um, doing the research. So, um, and that is one that, that's had a lot of testing on what's, what the content of that compost is. So you don't want to go out and got, get horse manure and just throw it on your lawn because you may end up with um, a lot of weed seeds from what the horses eat. So, and you do need to ID utilities and irrigation before doing that two inch aeration. Um, that's why we only go two inches in homeowner lawns is because we don't want to be hitting things, but you still need to make sure you know where those things are. So I'm not going to be able to see the chat box, um, but this is, I, I wanted folks to kind of chime in in the chat box and tell me what you think is going on here. Is this a disease? Um, what do you think is going on? And then Michelle, you guys can... You said bug... Oh, wait a minute. I can see the chat box. Okay. I got bug. 
Anybody else? Chinch bugs? Irrigation problems? Traffic? Okay, well, let me put another picture up. It may not let me put pictures up while I have chat open. Isn't that Somebody else said lack of water. Lack of water, okay. Looks Somebody like else said soil. Click on your slide and then try to advance. Your mouse just might not be. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so this is what it looked like about a month prior. Um, so it's always good to have a history of what's going on. When you go out and look at something, you know, it looks like something, but if you don't ask the questions, you may not know what's going on. And so this was the culprit. So there's no amount of fertilizer, water, um, fungicides, insecticides that would cure this. And it, what we have to do is locate where that culprit is and get him relocated and get him out of that area. So, so knowing that history. This is another one, believe it or not, this is a different picture. It is not the same lawn. Um, let's hear some guesses on that. Come on. <laughs> lack of water, lack of water, moisture, irrigation, brown patch. Okay. Yeah, and it is, it's really difficult to tell sometimes what's going on. This is another picture which may help a little bit. It's a little different angle of that area. This is another one. And so this is actually mower tracking. This is hot wheels of a mower going over a lawn so maybe they had and and again when things when we see things in the big picture it's going in a straight line and our diseases don't happen in straight lines so when we see that we have to kind of look at when did they come when did we see the damage um, and and ask those kind of questions so sometimes it's just recognizing that when you got this nice this nice even you know this nice straight line like this it's probably not a disease or insect issue so being aware of those kind of things. Um, what about this one? Somebody said pets. Low cut, Low cut mower. mower. Irrigation, oh, water damage, mower scalping. Okay, great. So there's another one, there's another one. Somebody said mower runoff, I mean water runoff, overwatering. I think you're frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. now we can. Okay, okay, good. I just got a, your internet connection is unstable message. Hopefully that'll go away. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is, these are all irrigation issues. So again, um, being able to, if you're out at a site, being able to turn that irrigation on before um, making a decision. And again, when you start seeing these uh, straight lines, you, you may want to, um, you know, wonder about something other than a disease or, or insect issue. So some of this was covered. Stephen covered a little bit of this when he did his um, presentation. So we'll go through this kind of quickly. And it seems like my screen is, there we go. So disease basics. So they're caused by a, patho a pathogenic organism or an environmental factor that contributes to the problem. So we get some sort of an abnormal alteration in plant development. So it can be physiological or morphological. And as, as I mentioned before, plants are really highly responsive to environmental extremes. So they have to be adapted to the region is what they're, they're grown and the use for which it's intended. So we wouldn't want to use a turf grass that doesn't have wear tolerance in a high wear area. So some of the, the, what we need to be aware of is those abiotic, non-infectious things, the things I've been talking about. So if we do scalping, if we have um, you know, water problems, um, if we have mower tracking, those sort of things, they're not infectious things, but they can ultimately contribute to a biotic or a pathological problem. Um, so anything else that, that we can think of, those deviations in physical properties, things we don't have control over, so temperatures, waters, pollutants, um, foreign chemicals, sometimes we'll get some, some runoff, some you know, flooding that may have contaminants in it. pH of the soil, um, that can all help contribute to us having a problem down the road. So as was mentioned earlier, we do have to have those three elements 
present. And if we can remove any one of those three elements, then there you have it, we can relieve that problem. Um, and so a lot of times what we're looking at is we don't have, if we don't have control over the environment, some of these pathogens with, with turf grass, they're naturally there in the soil. So if these two are interacting to make it be susceptible, then what we need to do is work on how to get rid of that pathogen with the right uh, preventative or, or you know, the right type of uh, fungicide to help with that problem or, or pesticide. Okay, so looking at these, these um, different types of biotic pathogens, most turf grass diseases are caused by fungi. And so this guy right here, that's a fungi. And it's great that this is a cell, one big old cell, and it kind of gives you an idea of the size of things. So head of a nematode, this is head of a nematode, fungus pathogen, um, we look at viruses when we talk about viruses. Here we go. This little tiny thing down there, and this is why viruses are so difficult to control. And then bacterium here. So we have some things, some bacteriums that bacteria that affect plants. Um, but for turf grass, it's mainly going to be the fungi. Okay. So go ahead and throw in your chat box what you think this may be. Can you see it, Susan? I see uh, brown patch, brown patch, brown patch, brown patch, lack of water. Okay. Somebody said fairy ring. Somebody no. said? Fairy ring. Fairy ring. Okay. We'll have a picture of fairy ring in a little bit. Okay. So again, right. just trying to, to drive the point home. It's really important to know, whoops, what it is. So that's actually nematodes. Um, and, and so it really, they can come, it can cause these dry patches, really spotty. Um, really difficult to manage if you can't afford um, the, the, the uh, labeled nematicides that are available. So very, very expensive to control. So you'll see sports fields and golf courses doing treatments for nematodes, but not so much in homeowner lawns. So it can be managed by doing um, more frequent uh, irrigation and more frequent low amounts of fertilizer and sometimes foliar fertilizers rather than those uh, slow release. Um, and that's because it does affect the roots ability to uptake water and nutrients. So again, you know, it's, it's difficult to look at something like this when someone calls you out and say, oh, what's going on without doing the tests. And this is why we kind of drive home those diagnostic services. So how am I doing for time? I've got about 20 minutes. Is that 20, 25 minutes maybe? Yep, you're good. Okay, so these are the, the primary turf grass diseases that we deal with. Um, and a lot of them are, they're gonna be similar. So again, using those diagnostic services, if you're not sure, um, bringing things in for us to take a look at. And I, my screen is, okay, here we go. So the environment triggers disease development. A lot of times our foliar diseases are gonna be triggered by low night temperatures. And so you can look specifically, we have three here that are triggered at different temperature ranges. You know, dollar spot, in greater than 50 degrees, but down in that cooler, those cooler night temperatures where we start getting that dew on the foliage. So foliar diseases, you know, the, this is a list of them. We're gonna be looking at the foliage for those sim the symptoms. Um, and when we talk about sign, signs and symptoms, symptoms is gonna be what happens to the grass? Does it turn, does it start turning yellow, orange, and then brown? Does it just get a sudden dead spot? Is it like dollar spot where it starts out with a little uh, silver dollar size spot and then they get a lot of them and they coalesce to make a big area? So we're gonna be looking at those kinds of symptoms. Signs is when you actually see what's causing it. So sometimes we'll actually see fungal hyphae right on the surface of the plant. And so that's a sign. Um, root diseases, uh, so there's a list of those that, that we look for primarily as being a root disease. A lot of times we don't see, we don't know it's a root disease until we start seeing the foliar damage. Um, so take all patch, that's a you know big one in our area. We'll start seeing the foliar damage and by then the roots are so damaged it, it's a renovation project. Um, and then we also have some stem and crown diseases where it'll start affecting the stem and the crown first. Um, and at different temperature reasons, uh, air, different temperature ranges. There we go. Okay, so take all root rot is very very common in um, in this area for especially our Saint Augustine grass, but it does affect all of our warm season grasses. It is naturally present in the soil, and we we call this GGG for short because who wants to say Gamanomyces gramus variety gram 
graminous, <laughs> graminous variety, graminous. Okay, so it's naturally present in the soil, and so it's going to infect turf under stress. So that's why it's so important to know what's going on with your turf grass regarding stress. We get these irregular yellow, light green patches. Um, from anywhere from a few inches to a few feet, and then they will coalesce together. They'll become one big, big plant or one big spot, and then entire plants die, resulting in thinning grass. And sometimes you get that real, like that bottom picture, you'll get this really kind of almost, almost looks like a burnt type of look to it. Um, and so you get these bare patches. And of course, when, when you get to where we're starting to see this kind of damage in the top, well, it's probably, it's probably not going to be able to come back from that. Um, I like to look at things microscopically. This is one that's really, really fun to look at microscopically. Um, and, and so we see these, these guys under the microscope. And you actually, with a hand lens, you can see it on the plant. So if you carry a hand lens around and you see a lot of these, um, it may be the problem. But uh, once you pull the, the plant out, you're going to see rotted roots. You're going to see really black rotted roots that, that really are not going to be able to support a plant coming back. Um, so you'll get that short black rotted root um, lesions and then it actually just rots away. So what are the conditions? Wet areas, high rainfall, over irrigation, and herbicide applications also can help stress the grass to make it more susceptible to this. Again, high pH soil. So what do we have in my area in Hillsborough County and Central Florida? We have a lot of pHs that are up in the sevens. Um, this is especially on new neighborhoods because we're pulling fill dirt out and putting it on top that tends to have a higher pH. Um, and it occurs typically in early summer and fall. However, we can start if it starts if it starts occurring early summer. We may not notice it till midsummer, um, and and then all of a sudden we've got calls going out for that. So it's really helpful not to mow too much at one time. That's not um, necessarily feasible in all cases. Uh, balanced nitrogen and potassium applications, so one to one. So using those like 18018s, um, that type of a, a, a mix, a balanced mix. Avoid nit nitrate nitrogen and quick release products. Um, applying micronutrients in the sulfate form. So the sulfate form is going to break down in its sort of a, an acidic form. So it'll help acidify that soil in, in high pH situations. Um, when it's really, really active, maybe doing foliar feeding if it's able to control. And there are some fungicides that are available to control this. It is important to look at some of the fungicide lists out there because we do have some fungicide resistance to some of these diseases and we do have fungicides that work better on different disease processes. So it's not just go out and buy heritage and that's going to take care of all your, your, your fungal problems on turf grass. Pythium root rot, it's another one that's naturally present on warm season uh, grasses. Again, wet soil conditions, stress turf grass, trigger the disease. You get kind of this non-specific decline in the turf grass, but it seldom dies from it. So you'll get these, these patches, but it doesn't, like the take-all root rot, in most cases it doesn't totally die, but you can get this gradual decrease in density and thinning. Of course, what happens when we have thinning? We get weeds. Um, so sometimes they, they end up being a renovation project also when you start having the weeds coming in. Um, th there's a neat little picture of how it looks microscopically. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect the crown and the root um, and the depth and density of roots will be drastically reduced because it's just not able to overcome that, um, that disease process. Again, wet soils, excessive rainfall or irrigation, poor surface, subsurface drainage, over irrigation, um, and you can get that when you have excessive thatch and organic matter accumulation, that, that again can help bring on that disease process. So if you're thinking about this, this is, this is we say, a crown root problem. So around the crown, if you've got excessive thatch and organic matter, it, it makes a, a great situation for that, that fungal pathogen to grow. So this is something that, that we see a lot on um, maybe on putting greens. Um, so aerifying and top dressing, controlling that thatch, um, and again, increased sunlight penetration. So sometimes around uh, golf greens and such, they'll try to see if they can remove or thin some trees that are putting a lot of shade on that turf. Um, and then they say labeled fungicides every 14 to 21 days. So again, this is not a true fungus, but fungicides do work on it. So it's very important to make sure that you've got the right fungicide to treat this problem. 
Now we said that was pythium root rot. There is also a, a pythium blight and that kills, rapidly kills cool season turf grasses that have been used to overseed warm season species in the winter. So ryegrass and, and different species that are used to overseed our warm season in the winter to keep that cover and green color. Um, so you'll get these distinct well-defined areas that may appear water soaked, darked and wilted and the turf will collapse and, and appear brown and matted with sometimes a bronze or reddish tinge to the border and so these are kind of those collapsed areas um, where, where it has um, the disease process going on. Um, this is one that, that you can actually go out and, and see the white erie cottony growth on the diseased areas. Um, and especially after we've had a lot of humidity, so cool nights and such. Um, so again, wet periods, high temperatures, ideal temperatures around 90 degrees. Um, there's little damage below 68. So again, this is because we're using a cool season turf grass in a warm season area. So you'll, you'll start seeing this disease process come in as our temperatures start warming up. Um, and in the in the springtime and this is why in, in many cases you'll have your your golf courses and sports fields go in with a kill um, with a herbicide while the other turf is still dormant dormant to get rid of the overseeded product okay um, so this particular one even if you do ideal practices you might not be able to manage it um, you know it, it's good if you can reduce irrigation so you don't have extended periods of leaf wetness or waterlogged soils but to get that seed established we need to be irrigating quite a bit so we can kind of set up some some soggy situations again improve air circulation um, avoid excessive applications of nitrogen if you can um, and it can also be spread by mechanical transmission, so traffic across affected areas and mowing. So if you do have the disease in there, you may want to save those areas to mow last and then clean your equipment, of course, before you mow again. Okay, so large patch. Large patch is very, very common in our area too. So we get these kind of um, yellowish to reddish brown to straw colored patches, but we'll actually see lo what looks like kind of good patches of turf in the center of the ring. And a lot of times that ring is going to have that distinctive orangey kind of um, ring on the outside with these patches of grass in the middle that look like they're doing okay. And those patches can then expand to several feet. Um, and we can get leaves that emerge from surviving crowns, so that's why we're having these, these little green patches in here. Um, herbicide damage can cause the same look of those symptoms, so being aware that we don't have herbicide damage going on rather than um, large patch. Um, the leaves that, are, that get infected are the closest to the soil. It eventually kills that leaf. We get this, this soft rot at the base of the leaf, and as you pull that, that leaf sheet sheath out if you smell it it has a really kind of rotten odor to it so if you're kind of wondering is it herbicide damage or is it large patch the herbicide damage typically doesn't have that nasty rot color to it and again there's kind of a neat little picture of um, what it looks like microscopically okay so again um, we're looking at excessive irrigation rainfall high humidity um, those leaves being continuous wet continuously wet. It's not normally absorbed, uh, observed in the summer. It's usually November through May, but a lot of times we'll notice it in May, June, July, or June timeframe when areas of the grass fail to green up. So it could be damage that started last November and went through the winter and maybe we didn't notice it. And then when, they, when the grass fails to green up like we expect, then we know we have a problem. So this is temperatures below 80 degrees typically. So again, avoid excess nitrogen during that threat period. Use slow release balanced nitrogen potassium applications. This is another one that mowers can spread that disease. So mow the diseased areas last and wash the clippings off the motor, mower before going to the next site. There are fungicides available to control. Gray leaf spot is very, very common with our St. Augustine grass and, and typically in, in residential areas, the, the grass kind of outgrows it. You know, you get that kind of look to it, you mow it and, it's, and takes it off. So, um, but you can get lots of little coalesced um, spots on leaves that like the, the, the top picture to the right, those little spots can kind of all grow together and you can get a lot worse looking um, blade of grass. Um, has kind of a gray felt uh, looking look to it, hence that name gray leaf spot. Um, 
And again, there is a picture, microscopic picture of how it looks when we look at it microscopically to figure out what's going on. Conditions, May through September, uh, when rainy spells have that leaf wetness. So again, lots of rain, wet, humidity, leaf blades remaining wet. So we see this typically in the summertime. So avoid late afternoon or evening irrigation. We can't do anything about the thunderstorms that occur late afternoon, but there you have it. If you're irrigating, don't irrigate then. Atrazine applications, um, that herbicide made before or during the disease favorable conditions can increase disease development. So timing of atrazine applications is very important. Um, again, avoiding excess nitrogen, use slow release sur sources that are balanced, nitrogen, potassium, and again, there are fungicides available to control. I think this might be our last one, so dollar spot. Um, so sunken little patches, I mentioned this earlier, dollar looks like a little size of a little silver dollar. Um, they rarely exceed two inches in diameter, but you can get so many of them that they, they grow together and it looks like one big disease process. Um, you can also see that sign of those, the white mycelium on the grass, uh, after, especially after a dewy night. And um, so you, you can get kind of looking like these kind of bleached out looking spots. Um, and look a closer look at the leaf blade um, over there on the right side. It turns yellow green to straw colored with a with a reddish border. So if you looked at this real close, you'd see almost kind of like a little reddish border along that, that lesion. Um, and then again, there's that microscopic that we use for identification. Temperatures between 60 and 80, that's a good part of our year. Warm days, cool nights, intense dew, continuous high humidity. So just those same things that we see over and over again. Um, we wanna give it adequate nitrogen in spring and summer, mow regularly, increase air circulation if you can, irrigate deep and infrequently. And again, there are some fungicides available to control it. St. Augustine mosaic disease, we say it's new, but it has been around in, um, in our area, well, all over the East Coast. Um, Pinellas County is the county that's hardest hit for, with this in our area. I think they've had, they've had thousands of cases over in Pinellas County. Um, it started over there, I believe they, they saw it again around, two, I don't think I have it on my slide, nope, around 2010, 12 time frame, and then it kind of took off. So this um, is, is um, primarily is affecting our St. Augustine Floritam lawns, which I mentioned earlier is our most planted lawn in Florida. Um, that picture on the top right is showing um, the damage on, on the right and left sides from it, from that decline. And then this is an area that was resodded with a different type, a different cultivar of St. Augustine. So it's surviving. Uh, what we found is that once it dies, you can't plant Floritam back in there again, because uh, it will in uh, two, two to three years, it will die again. So using a different um, type of St. Augustine, a different cultivar, or even a different grass, such as zoysia grass instead of that. This is how that disease progression, progression looks. You get these very horizontal uh, looking mosaic patterns, so very horizontal unlike a lot of our other disease lesions are kind of round or irregular and have borders going across. These are very long, uh, kind of bleached out spots on, on the leaves. Um, and there's a lot of research going on to, um, to find out what the actual causative agents. Right now they're thinking it's a combination of this St. Augustine um, mosaic disease and a Bermuda grass that's causing it to be a problem. There are lots of other disease, uh, disease out there that definitely don't have time to go into, but um, just to mention a couple, slime mold, rust. Um, this is another one you can put in your chat box and tell me what you think it is. Someone saying fairy ring? That is correct, it is fairy ring. And uh, uh, typically, this is where a big oak tree had been removed. So sometimes we'll, we'll find that there's been some kind of rotting material underground um, that was left there during construction that kind of contributes to it. Um, there's three different types of fairy rings. Some of them don't form mushrooms and some of them do form mushrooms, but pretty easy to see. So we'll go ahead and do those next couple of poll questions. All right, let me get it up here. Okay.
Okay, it looks like we're pretty close and it looks like uh, that, that first one is true that cultural and environmental, environmental factors can trigger disease development. Um, and on number two, yes, fungi are what causes most turf grass, turf grass diseases. And um, that third one, the condition that most turf grass diseases have in common is wet periods and high humidity. And on number four, um, it's, it is all of the above and most people got that. So we want to avoid in most cases excess nitrogen. We want to apply balanced nitrogen phosphorus and use labeled preventative fungicides. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll out and I've got a few if I can get my slides to go on. Okay, so when you, when you are faced with an issue and you don't know what it is, there is sort of the, what I call the five-step process to froze up again. Okay, but first off, you need to ask questions. Has it happened before? How long? What's been the progression? How often is it irrigated? What have been the fertilizer pesticide applications? What's been done to try to, to um, correct it? And these are those five, those five steps. So we want to identify the affected grass species because some diseases affect um, grass species certain species more often than they do others. Observe those symptoms, know what those environmental conditions are, identify the visible or microscopic signs, and I have my little, my portable microscope. I don't, yeah, there it is. You can't really see it too well. It looks like it's flashing out, but I have a portable microscope that I can take out into the field and put the, put the results up on the screen for people to see. Um, and I, talk, I talked about the symptoms. You really want to look at overall and close up. So a lot of times people will send me photos and I, I need to see the overall big picture and kind of like a maybe a couple feet away and then a close up of it. Um, we do want to do collection and submission of samples correctly. So when that disease is active or increasing, sample where it's representative of the entire area, collect at the edge of the infected area, include both healthy and infected plant. We do have our turf grass rapid diagnostic, which I've put that website at the bottom here. If you just do a Google search for UF rapid turf grass, you'll get to the diagnostic clinic. And it has all the information on there, the submission guidelines, what's going on with diseases, the submittal form, which you do have to put with, with every sample that's sent in. Um, and don't send samples on Thursdays or Fridays because they may sit somewhere um, and it'll give you all those submission guidelines that they want the sample collected within 12 hours of being mailed, not to sit around in a hot truck all day. So here I have one, one or two more slides where we're looking at what do you think's going on. So if you guys can put that into your chat box, that'd be great. And I'm trying to get to my, there we go. Whoops. Okay, there's another one. And I'm hoping that if you look real closely, you'll see some dog toys here. So this is male dog damage. So you can see he's marking his territory around the tree and around the perimeter of the property. So he's marking his territory. So just be aware when you see that's the, that urine helping to fertilize. Um, and again, that's another picture of that. How about this one? That looks a little bit more like a disease process starting. Okay, and my time is about up, so I'm going to, okay, so that's female dog spot, and they tend to, they tend to produce these kind of little circular areas. They may go out and pee in, the, in about the same area every day, but they dump all their urine at once, and so rather than putting a spot here and a spot there like male dogs do to, to, um, that, has a better effect on maybe adding some <laughs> some some nutrients to the soil. The dog, the female dogs, dump so much in one place that a lot of times we'll get these dead spots. Okay, and I think I think this may be my last one, and um, and this is where I've I've have homeowners that that'll they'll be all upset. They'll think this is some kind of an insect issue because there's dirt out here, and this is actually from sandhill cranes going along the edge picking. Um, to find uh, some grubs and such grubs and worms to eat. So just be aware of what you're looking at. 
Um, these resources, I think my, Michelle will probably make these slides available. So there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, this is a, a, the first one is a publication that one of our, um, our co-workers up in Duval County put together. And these are really good for commercial professionals that give you the types of fungicides to use on different types of diseases. Um, there's a good turf grass disease management publication that we have. I am stuck again. Okay, Managing Mississippi Sports Fields. This is a really good publication. Unfortunately, UF does not really have any good sports field management publications, but um, Mississippi State has Jay McCurdy. Um, this is just one table uh, out of that uh, particular publication, but he goes through, it just, it's just a really good general managing sports fields recommendations so but he does have the different types of chemistries available to us just be aware of making sure on these labels uh, when we look at publications from other states that they are labeled for use in florida the stma sports field management um, online um, magazine is a really good source for some some good um, feature articles and that sort of thing and of course if you're a sports field manager it's a great organization to be a member of um, NC, NC State has a Turf Files website that is a really good website too that has quite a bit of good information. As you can see down here, they have a tab on diseases.